Great Lakes Prepping here. Lots of us have our basic first aid trauma kits, our stack of free government COVID tests of questionable accuracy, and even our emergency antibiotics kit from the internet. But in this video, we're taking a detour from ACE bandages and antibiotics and talking about a few pieces of medical diagnostics gear that most people probably don't have in their home, but definitely could. Now, I've been a bit neurotic since basically forever. I was a weird kid and now, well, I guess I'm a weird adult. I'm somewhat of a germaphobe, probably obsessive compulsive, and almost certainly a hypochondriac. And while I tried very hard through my 20s and 30s to suppress a lot of it and just put every ache, pain, and weird feeling out of my mind, not that I was ever especially successful, I find that to be increasingly impossible in my 40s. Ah, middle age, when you might wake up paralyzed because your pillow was one inch to the left of where it normally is. When I was a teenager, I would literally jump from my second story bedroom window just to like expedite the process of going outside. And now I may very well throw my back out for two weeks because I leaned over the sink weird while washing a plate. So it's only natural, if not unavoidable, that in middle age, I'm preoccupied with thoughts a lot more regularly of health, well-being, and potential illness. And while my 40s have bestowed upon me a small handful of legitimate, unpleasant medical diagnoses, such as sleep apnea and hypertension, to name a couple, I tend to exist in a moderate but persistent state of paranoia about certain medical issues and diseases that I don't actually happen to have yet. And I know this is considered to be a controversial thing to talk about in some prepper circles, but like I said, hypochondriac. The entire COVID debacle did absolutely nothing to help the neuroticism and in fact very likely exacerbated it. Accordingly, I found myself accumulating a small handful of home medical testing and self-diagnostics gadgets to basically help put my mind at ease every time I felt weird and was on the verge of proclaiming that this is the big one, Elizabeth. And that brings us to what this video is really about. This is what I playfully refer to as my hypochondriac prepper kit. So let's take a look and see what's inside. Now real quick, I'll start off by saying that I do realize that it's maybe a little bit silly that I've kind of packaged this whole thing up in one of these impact resistant, kind of heavy duty plastic cases. But you know what? A couple of the things in here weren't especially cheap. And you know, it's just a bit of a nicer, more convenient, more portable kind of a container than just throwing all this stuff in an old box or something. Plus, I am a little bit obsessed with uh, this style of hard shell plastic case for all sorts of various equipment and gadgets and so forth. But I will say that I did get a pretty cheap one, relatively speaking, for this little project because, you know, it, I'm not going to be taking this thing on safari. It's never going to be outdoors. So I went with one of the cheaper options I can find. And it's still a pretty decent case. The latches, they're okay. They do the job fine. It's pretty thick, heavy-duty plastic. The inside has some good, thick foam padding, cushioning, including on the top of the lid here. And it's one of those deals where the, uh, the sort of insert has all these perforations in it so you can pluck out little tiny squares and make your indentations and so forth uh, any shape and size that you want. And underneath the piece of foam that you can make your own cutouts in, there's another layer of foam beneath that. The only real complaint I have about this particular case is that the lid is actually heavier than the box itself, and in my case, that includes the content. So if I'm to open this lid as far back as it can go, which is about like that, and let it go, it tips the whole case backwards, which is pretty stupid, and I, I honestly don't know why the lid had to be as heavy as it is compared to the rest of the box. So for that reason alone, I probably wouldn't buy this exact brand or model again. Whatever. It does suit my purpose fine for what it is. So for now, I'm just going to wedge something that was nearby underneath it so this thing won't tip backwards while I'm making this video. So let's get into the actual contents of my self-testing hypochondriac kit. First, not especially interesting, 
a thermometer. Why not? There was room in the box, and that's pretty much the most basic uh, self-diagnostics tool that you could possibly have. Now, to get a little bit more into what I was talking about with regards to hypochondria and my particular sort of paranoias and neuroses about getting sick or getting a disease, I think I can categorize them for the most part in about three categories. The first and the one that maybe haunts me the most is heart attack. Something's going wrong, I instantly wonder, is this a heart attack? Second would probably be something like lung disease. I've personally lost a small handful of people who pretty much suddenly got lung cancer or another serious lung disease and their decline was rapid and inescapable. And it's not done a lot to help my paranoia about lung disease. Third on my list, diabetes. Type 2 diabetes runs in my family a little bit. And unfortunately, I've got a few of the kind of right ingredients for type 2 diabetes to eventually kind of kick in. Some within my control, probably. Some not within my control. So those three kind of categories have certainly influenced the devices that I've got in my little kit here. First, we've got a glucose meter. I've got the digital glucose meter itself and the little finger pricking apparatus. And underneath it here in the case, we've got our test strips and some of the control solution. And I should put a couple of spare batteries to this thing in there because uh, this thing actually doesn't get used all that frequently and it seems that the battery is dead every other time I might think to use it. Again, I do not currently have diabetes, but anytime I think I might, and I'm not in especially close proximity to my next doctor's appointment, I can take a little glucose test and put my mind at ease a little bit. Now this next little gizmo you've probably seen at the doctor's office, and in fact, they actually became a little bit popular for home purchases during the whole pandemic. This is called a pulse oximeter, and between you and me, I had one since before it was cool. But anyway, like I said, if you go to regular doctor appointments for checkups, they've probably snapped one of these things on your finger and maybe you knew what it was, maybe you had no idea. Pretty much all it does is tells you what your blood oxygen level is. I put it on my finger, let it do its thing for, I don't know, five, 10 seconds, and then it'll give me a couple of numbers. That first number, that's meant to represent your blood oxygenation percentage, and mine's at about 97, 98, which is considered good and normal. And then the next number there is my BPM, my heart beats per minute, and mine is a little higher than usual anyway, but running around, setting things up to make a video, talking, whatever, it's up a little higher than normal. Again, nothing that would raise any red flags for me in particular. These little gadgets started getting popular during the whole COVID thing because one of the signs of potentially serious COVID was that your blood oxygen levels were lower because your lungs weren't, you know, bringing in enough oxygen into your blood cells and so forth. So people were buying these things up so they could kind of get a gauge of whether or not they thought, mm, do I have serious COVID or do I not? Who knows? But for me, I actually bought this a while ago when I started having a lot of weird symptoms that were ultimately attributed to severe sleep apnea. Throughout the day, I would feel, and I haven't been able to figure out really any other way to describe it, except that there wasn't enough oxygen in my body. I was taking deep breaths. I didn't feel short of breath. It's just something about my whole body and brain felt like there wasn't enough O2 in me somehow, which made no sense until, of course, I learned that I have sleep apnea and really what, uh, what that really means. So these days I wear the CPAP mask every night and as much as I hate it with every fiber of my body, uh, it's made a big difference and I don't feel like sort of walking death every day as I was describing. I guess that being said, if you think you might have sleep apnea, it's very possibly ruining your life and if you're scared to get the sleep study and get the CPAP because you're worried you're going to hate it, you are going to hate it. You're going to hate the sleep study more than anything you've ever hated and it's going to take you months before you stop actively deeply vocally hating wearing the CPAP machine, but eh, as much as it sucks, and it does suck, uh, eh, I don't feel good without it. I feel like there's something medically wrong with me every single day if I don't wear it, uh, because there is. Sleep apnea is essentially you not getting any kind of quality sleep because uh, several times a minute your, your body's essentially dying itself awake. So my little PSA there, Ugh, I put it off for a long time, suspected sleep apnea, finally got it diagnosed, whatever, got it treated. It's not fun, but it will improve your life a lot. 
And just another quick tangent, in the intro to the video, I mentioned in addition to sleep apnea, I'm blessed enough to have been bestowed a case of uh, mild to severe hypertension. That's high blood pressure. And so the old blood pressure cuff is nothing new to me and hasn't been for uh, quite a long time now. Uh, and I guess this would qualify as diagnostics gear, but I'm not really going to spend any kind of time talking about in this video for a couple reasons. First, I think everybody knows what this is already, and it's not especially weird or uncommon. Hypertension is incredibly common, and so odds are pretty good that you may already have one of these. And, and secondly, I didn't really include it as part of my kit because it's just clear that there's no way it would have fit in my little kit. So it doesn't get to be part of the, the hypochondriacs club in the little box here. Uh, it would pretty much be the only thing that could fit in that box if I included it. Whatever, that's okay. It doesn't need to be in the kit. And that brings us to our last little gadget, and this is probably the most ridiculous and I'm sure was the most expensive thing in this in this kit. And this is a home EKG machine. Now they make home EKG meters in all sorts of different types and styles and levels of elaborateness. Uh, and this one's kind of middle of the road. Again, anyone that goes to the regular doctor's appointments and is anywhere close to middle age has certainly had a routine EKG. It's where they stick a bunch of little wire leads all over your arms, legs, and chest and measure electrical impulses uh, basically between those different contact points. This helps the doctor get a really accurate idea of, you know, the, the pulse, the electrical signals coming into your heart and coming out of your heart. And that can give them a lot of insight into if there's maybe something wrong with either your left side or your right side of your heart or something else. But anyway, I actually bought this around the same time that I got the pulse oximeter. In addition to feeling like I didn't have enough oxygen in my body, I was also having other symptoms like rapid heartbeat or frequent heart palpitations, all of which I'm pretty certain were all symptoms of the sleep apnea that had been untreated. Sleep apnea puts a terrible burden on your heart because in absence of you getting enough oxygen, your heart has to try to work harder to both keep you alive and I guess wake you up when you're suffering suffocating to death 10 times a minute, so forth. But as is what you do when you're a hypochondriac, anytime you have a symptom, you Google it. And a lot of symptoms of the sort of racing heartbeat and palpitations uh, uh, can be symptoms of much more serious things. Not to say that sleep apnea is not serious, but it's not as immediately serious as some other things. So the way this works is there's a couple of metal contacts on one side and one metal contact on the other. And this, this particular model can be used in a couple of ways. For an EKG to be of any value, there has to be at least two contact points. You know, a big high-end medical grade one is going to have, I don't know, six or eight or ten wires coming out of it that attach all over your body. Most of these sort of home grade ones have two or three. Now, I just usually use this with two. I'll use a finger from each hand. There is a third contact here that can be placed on a like a thigh or a calf to get a third contact point. I haven't really gotten that far into it because I don't really understand the value in that versus just the two fingers, or at least I'm not sure I would know how to interpret or, or uh, find anything useful out of the results of that. Because again, I'm not a medical professional. I'm pretty much just an idiot with an Amazon account. But this thing does exactly what I hoped it did, and that's to reduce some of my insanity when I have a heart heart palpitation and this thing will give me a pretty good indication that I'm not having a heart attack right now. So I'm going to put one finger on this contact and one finger on this contact, try to hold them there as consistently as I can, and it's going to start registering my heartbeat. And after not quite a minute, it'll give me a little message that says no abnormalities. Now, there's deeper diagnostics and data that this thing will show, and I believe you got to plug it into a computer and sort of parse that information on a, on a computer program. I have not gone that far into it. All I'm looking for is that no abnormalities. If my heart rate was unusually fast or unusually slow or beating in the wrong sort of pattern or timing, it might say possible arrhythmia or possible something, at which time I could start freaking out. And in fact, the first couple times I used this thing, I didn't have my fingers seated perfectly on these contacts and it actually gave me a message that said possible arrhythmia because, and I'll see if I can reproduce that, I'm moving my fingers around a little bit, kind of making contact and breaking contact. And it's probably going to come back with a warning or a possible arrhythmia or something like that. Possible tachycardia VBP couple. I don't even know what VBP couple is, but 
I learned pretty quick that you got to make sure to keep your fingers on those contacts quite snugly and, and without moving them around at all. Now, not too long after I bought this, did I happen to notice that a lot of models of smartwatch were actually including a similar type of EKG feature in them. I think the Apple Watch, probably the higher end Fitbit, I think even some of the Samsung, Samsung watches. And I didn't understand how that worked at first. I thought there's no way that can make any sense because it's just, you know, on your wrist, one contact point, and you really need to have at least two on kind of opposite sides of your heart for it to be of any value. But more recently, uh, I was told that there's actually another contact somewhere on the face of the watch that you would touch with your other hand when using the EKG feature. And so that's pretty cool. And your smartwatch might already have something like that. You may have to buy a, you know, five or $10 app for you to actually be able to use that feature. I don't know. Rather than spending maybe a bunch more money on a standalone device, if you're only looking for that little message that says no abnormalities or similar, the feature on your smartwatch might do that just fine. I do know that devices like this are actually recommended to people with diagnosed heart disease so they can do tests at home and that data can actually be kind of uploaded for their doctor or some other medical professional to review or look at, maybe in between doctor visits or at some regular interval. I don't know if the smartwatch versions do all that, but again, if you're just a regular schmo with an Amazon account and uh, a little bit of paranoia, uh, I tell you that little no abnormalities uh, makes a big difference uh, in kind of my level of sanity if I'm not feeling right. And these other two little compartments here are just for the charging cable and a sort of wall plug for the charging cable. I wanted to keep them all together and this thing does have an internal rechargeable battery whereas these other things have a replaceable little button batteries. So I figured I might as well keep those right there with it. So that's about it. Do you have a weirdo kit like this of your own? If so, is there any good stuff I may be missing? Let me know in the comments. And if you want to take a look at any of this specific stuff in my kit, I'll put links to everything in the video description below. Be sure to like and subscribe and stay up to date with all our latest stuff, including future prepper gear videos. Thanks for watching, and until next time, this is Great Lakes Prepping.